Welcome back to our studies in Romans 8, the greatest chapter in the Bible. And uh, this is, I think, study number three. And we're going to look at verses 9 through 11. But before we do that, I want to go back to verse 8, because surprising as this may sound, verse 9 follows verse 8 uh, in more ways than one. And verse 8 says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And that's one of those definitive statements that you find in the Bible. Those who are in the flesh, those who are in Adam, those who are still dead in trespasses and in sins, those who are not born again, those who are not in union with Christ, those who have not been buried with Christ and raised with Christ and who now sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, those who are in the flesh. It's talking about unbelievers. It's talking about those who are not indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And it's a very precise statement. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And then in verse 9, he says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And let's pause for a second and see what it is that Paul is doing he, he wants them to be assured. He, he wants his readers, who are Christians, who are trusting in the gospel, who are trusting in Jesus, he wants them to be assured. That is the pattern, and it ought to be the expectation of the Christian life. We should be assured, and we shouldn't be walking around in a spirit of non-assurance about whether we're Christians or not, whether we're saved or not, whether we're forgiven or not. And so Paul is saying, you, and of course he impl he's implying here, you who are trusting in Jesus, you who understand the doctrine of justification by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. It is so very important to know who you are, to know your identity. And we live in an age where there's a great deal of confusion as to how we know our identity and so on. And, and in various areas, we are in, at sea. Uh, worldly mindsets are operating, uh, causing a great deal of confusion as to answering that question, who are you? But the New Testament is very clear, isn't it? If you are in Christ, if you're trusting in Jesus, you are a Christian and you have an assurance. You may entertain an assurance that you are a Christian and you may entertain an assurance that you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So verse 9, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. And so Paul is making a very clear uh, statement that Christians are those who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And I want us to see in these verses, 9, 10, and 11, the various ways in which the apostle uh, refers to the Holy Spirit. You notice, for example, in verse 9, he's referred to as the Spirit of God. And then a little later in verse 9, the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. And in addition to that, he says in verse 9, you are in the Spirit, you are indwelt by the Spirit, the Spirit dwells in you. You are in the Spirit and the Spirit is in you. And so Paul can change the language a little, but one of the things that emerges from these verses is that we shouldn't make a distinction between the gospel as that gospel focuses on Jesus and what he has done and the gospel as it focuses on, say, the work of the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. 
the Holy Spirit is the same Spirit who indwelt Christ, the Spirit who raised Christ from the dead. The Spirit that Jesus spoke of in the upper room, I go away, but I will come to you again. And he's talking about Pentecost and he's talking about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is a redemptive act. Pentecost is a continuation and an application and a consequence of the finished work of Christ upon the cross. How is that which Christ has achieved applied by the Spirit? I give a, another paraclete, another comforter, another advocate, however you translate the word parakletos uh, in the upper room. And Jesus was promising that his personal representative agent, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, would apply the finished work. He's the Spirit of Christ. He indwells us. He is in us. The Spirit is in us. Christ is in us. And I think we're meant to understand those two as synonymous ideas rather than different um, ideas. So the question that's been before us in these verses here in the opening chapter of um, Romans is, how can I know that I'm a Christian? How can I know that I'm a child of God? How can I know that the Holy Spirit is in me? And, and you notice he says, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. And that raises the question, how do I know then that the Spirit of God dwells in me? And he goes on to say, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But, and here's verse 10, answering the question, if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Our sins are forgiven. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The guilt of sin has been taken away. Jesus has borne our guilt and carried it away. He has satisfied the demands of divine justice, but we still live in a body. Not that the body is in itself sinful, but the body is still subject to decay and that curse of death still remains. So unless Jesus comes and then those who are alive will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, as Paul tells the Thessalonians, we are all going to die. The body is death because of sin. It is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. There's a marvelous story from the Puritan Thomas Goodwin and a contemporary of uh, John Owen that we were thinking about in our last study together. And uh, Thomas uh, Goodwin uh, was a professor and teaching at the university and he was interviewing prospective students. And in the 17th century, you could be a prospective student at university at the age of 12 uh, rather than 18. And uh, probably this individual was in his early teens and Thomas Goodwin as the Puritan minister, theologian, scholar that he was, asked the boy as he walked into this darkened office with a small little window, are you ready to die? And the boy uh, was terrified and ran out of the room and it became something uh, of a joke, I think, in uh, years to come that Thomas Goodwin had terrified this little boy by asking, was he ready to die? 
And of course, Thomas Goodwin was asking the question, are you trusting in Jesus? Are you ready to face your maker? Are you a Christian? Are your sins forgiven? Do you know what's going to happen to you five seconds after you die? Where are you going to be? Where will your consciousness be? Where will you be? And so Paul is saying the body is dead if, in Christ, if Christ is in you, verse 10, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. And uh, the ESV has capitalized spirit here. You understand, of course, that in the Greek uh, pneuma, pneumatos, um, the Greek doesn't distinguish between lowercase and uppercase. And sometimes it can refer to our spirit, perhaps our soul, um, and sometimes it can refer to the Holy Spirit. And, and here, it's not that the body is dead because of sin and the soul is life because of righteousness. Paul isn't drawing a contrast between body and soul, and, and that would be a dangerous distinction to draw, especially in, in a sort of Greek culture background that often viewed the body with disdain as being just the prison house of the soul. That's not the contrast that he's drawing. He's drawing the contrast between those who are in Adam and those who are in Christ. And those who are in Adam do not have the Holy Spirit, and those who are in Christ have the Holy Spirit. They're indwelt by the Spirit of Jesus. And, and what's the logic of his thought? And the logic of his thought is the same logic that he employed back in Romans chapter 6. That if we are in union with Christ, there is a sense in which when Jesus died, we died. And when Jesus rose, we rose. And therefore, Romans 6 begins with that language of being buried with Christ and raised with Christ to newness of life. And so he makes it very explicit in verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. And so he's, he's going back to the resurrection of Jesus. And he's saying, when you become a Christian, when you are born again, and, and it's not important that you know the date when you are born again. Actually, regeneration takes place at the level of the subconscious, I think, and what we see is the effect of it. And in my case, I can give you, I can give you a precise date. I can tell you it was December the 28th at about 11.30 at night in 1971. But my wife, who was raised in a Presbyterian home and went twice on Sunday to church and Sunday school in between and sat around the piano playing hymns in the afternoon, can't tell you a single day where she wasn't conscious of being a Christian. She, she was converted in her mother's arms. She was converted when she had no consciousness of her own identity, I think. And God sometimes does that, as in the case of Samuel, and as in the case of John the Baptist and, and others, they are converted perhaps in their mother's womb by the power of the Holy Spirit and come into this world regenerate. It, it's not important that we can date the moment of our conversion. The question that's far more important is, are we alive? And how do we know that we are alive? And Paul says, we are alive if the default of our mindset is Jesus. We are alive because the Holy Spirit resides in us and it is, it is the Holy Spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit who raised Christ from the dead and he raised Christ from the dead and you are in union with him. It's quite staggering, isn't it, when you think about it? that back there when Jesus rose from the dead, he had me in mind. And he had my salvation in mind. And eventually I would be born and eventually the Holy Spirit would regenerate me and make existentially true what was actually true when Jesus rose from the dead. 
and was actually true in a covenant of redemption in eternity that involved the Father and the Son in saving his people. So look at the logic again in verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. Now, he has to say that because he has already said the body is dead because of sin. Unless Jesus comes, we're all going to die. The solemn truth is we don't know how long we have to live in this world. The solemn truth is we don't know whether we will be alive tomorrow. And therefore we need to be ready and prepared. And the gospel gives us that readiness and that preparation. So is the body of no use whatsoever? Are we only to think of our souls? Are we only to think of some kind of spiritual redemption? And that would be wholly contrary to the entire pattern of thought in the scripture. God created us body and soul, and God will recreate us body and soul. And there is coming a day when Jesus comes again when the dead in Christ shall arise. I serve as the senior minister of First Presbyterian Church in Columbia in South Carolina. And a few years ago, uh, we engaged in some choir loft um, repairs and extension, and it was quite a, an elaborate piece of uh, engineering and it took the best part of about a year. We were out of the building for a while, while that was going on. And in the process, as often occurs, the deacons decide to do other things since the building was now empty and uh, renew carpet and put down different flooring and so on. But in that process, we discovered that right below the pulpit and somewhat to the left were two graves. And they were Mr. and Mrs. Law. We looked for Mr. and Mrs. Gospel on this side, <laughs> but couldn't find them. But we hadn't realized that every time I sat on a chair in that section and gave a children's address at the 8.30 service on Sunday morning, I'm actually standing on top of Mr. and Mrs. Law. And uh, I, I trust they were believers, and I, I look forward to meeting them one day in glory. But I've often said to the children, Mr. and Mrs. Law are beneath us here, and when Jesus comes, they're gonna rise. Because we have no fear of death. Uh, our church is in uh, the middle of a churchyard, and, and to get from our church to our fellowship hall, for example, you walk through graves uh, along a path on either side. And our children are very familiar with gravestones and very familiar with what that means, and it's not spooky to them uh, at all. And uh, our two church cats, who are called Samson and Delilah, uh, and they make sure the mice are kept at bay in our church kitchen, and they're very friendly cats, but they sleep in the graveyard. Uh, but Paul is saying here, one day, these bodies are going to rise and they're going to rise as new bodies, but bodies nevertheless, because we were created body and soul. And I personally can't imagine an existence without a body and, and what the body, what that existence will be like in the intermediate state between death and resurrection when our souls immediately pass into the presence of the Lord Jesus, but our bodies lie in the grave until the resurrection morning. I can't imagine what that existence is like apart from a body. I'm not sure I can tell you how I can explain consciousness. And I believe there is consciousness and self-awareness and awareness of each other in the intermediate state. And, and, and maybe God provides for us some kind of temporary body uh, in the intermediate state. But Paul isn't looking at the intermediate state. 
the focus of Paul's attention, and actually it's always the focus of New Testament expectation, is not what happens five seconds after you die. That's an important question. Jesus referred to it with the dying thief, today you will be with me in paradise. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But actually the New Testament focus is on the new heavens and the new earth. So I'm often asked the question, what is heaven like? And I have to respond to that question by saying, well, what do you mean by heaven? Do you mean the intermediate state? Or do you mean the new heavens and new earth? Because if you mean the latter, as I think you probably do, then I say it's like this, without sin. It's like this in the sense that it's physical and I have a body and I expect to have arms and legs and will be male and female and not androgynous beings. And there will be mountains and rivers and grass and buildings. Didn't Jesus say in my house are many mansions? And I don't think he's simply speaking in metaphor. He's saying there'll be somewhere for you to live and dwell and experience eternity. And people ask, are there dogs in heaven? And I say, of course there are dogs in heaven. Why would there not be dogs? So now, I'm not sure about Samson and Delilah, the cats, but, but actually I believe that all of God's creatures will be in the new heavens and in the new earth. He intends to recreate the beauty and wonder and magnificence of his creation. And the pinnacle of his creation is our body. Our bodies decay. I'm a few days away from a very important birthday. I know that our bodies decay, but we're promised a brand new body. And, and we have a thousand questions about it. But look at what Paul says. He says, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is remind us of the importance of our bodies and the importance that sanctification and the pattern of sanctification works itself out in our bodies. And Paul has already said that in verse, uh, in, in chapter 6, when he speaks about the instruments of our body in those opening verses of chapter um, 6 of, uh, of Romans. So the question then that's before us here in this passage it was the question that came before us in our previous study. What is it to have a spiritual mindset? And we answered that question by saying that it's a mindset that thinks the way the spirit thinks. And therefore we asked the question, how does the spirit think? Or what does the spirit think about? What are the concerns of the Holy Spirit? And I think a part of that answer is that holiness, that Jesus' likeness work itself out in your body because your body matters, because your body is going to be raised from the dead in newness of life. And the Holy Spirit who indwells us is the guarantee of that. He's the down payment of that. Well, we'll continue our studies in Romans, the greatest chapter in the Bible, uh, in our next study. But there we take a break.